My name's Tom Armitage and I uh, work for Adina on the Geo User Support and I'm accompanied today by Ian Holmes who will be answering your questions. So if you've got any questions at all during the webinar, just use that panel on the right hand side there um, to, to ask questions and uh, we'll do our best to answer them right now but uh, some of them may have to wait until a little bit later. Okay, so what are we going to talk about today? Um, so we're going to have a look at what data is available from um, Edina that you can use, take from data download uh, from Digimap uh, and how we can get that into QGIS. So what formats should you be picking uh, and then how to get that data in. Uh, then we'll look a bit more in depth at QGIS and how to style the data and do some simple geoprocessing in there too. Uh, we'll also talk about a few of the plugins and a few other tips and tricks for using QGIS as well. Okay, so let's start with the, here's the Digimap homepage. Collections down the left hand side and they pretty much all contain data. Every single data um, uh, product that we have in, in uh, Digimap can be used in QGIS. So here's a, um, a slide showing you all the different uh, data sets that we have from Ordnance Survey, Historic Digimap, which is the scanned historic Ordnance Survey maps, Geology data from the Geology Collection, again Marine Environment is the land cover data sets, uh, the aerial Digimap, which has the detailed um, 25 centimeter resolution aerial imagery. And LiDAR, our newest collection, which is download only, high resolution LiDAR data from the Environment Agency of England uh, and Wales, and also the SEPA, the Scottish Environmental Protection Agency too, uh, including digital terrain models, digital surface models, but also point cloud data and there's some aerial in imagery and near infrared imagery available in that service too. It comes free with the aerial collection, so if you're subscribed to the aerial Digimap, then you'll get access to the LiDAR data too. So downloading data, each collection has a data download facility uh, and this is where you go to get the data that you're going to be using in QGIS. It's a pretty simple three-step process. You um, go into the data download facility, select your area, choose the products that you want from the left-hand side for that area, um, and then you add them to your basket. And it's in the basket where you have all the different options for um, selecting format uh, and, and that sort of thing. And it's the format that's the most important uh, element when you're choosing data for use in QGIS. So having a look, um, when you've got the uh, side panel selecting your data open at the side, you can click on these info um, links in there to see what formats the data are available in and a, and a few sample uses, that sort of thing. Um, you need to click on the category names to open up uh, what, what's in those things. So here we've got the Ordnance Survey, things like background, background mapping is all your uh, geotiffs, uh, land and height would be where you go for the Ordnance Survey's digital terrain models and contours, not the, uh, not the ones in the LiDAR collection obviously. Uh, vector data, again range of different scales and formats, boundary and location data, things like your administrative boundaries, postcode boundaries uh, and gazetteers. There's also an availability grid for each product, so you can get that by either clicking on the info and sh then there's a show availability link in the info for each product, or just bringing open the uh, show availability grids from the right hand side of the data download interface. This is really good, um, it shows you where the data is available for. For Ordnance Survey, um, there's only things like the building heights data that actually aren't national coverage, but it's very important in other products, uh, particularly historic, LIDAR, where the coverage is very patchy for, for, for different eras in historic and for different uh, resolutions in LIDAR. So here we are, have uh, uh, the basket. Uh, and you can see this, the format, we used to have a default format in there for each product, but we, re, we now make you choose. Uh, and that's really important because it makes sure that you, you, you pay attention to this and, and select the, the format that's um, best, the best option for the software that you're using. So the main difference here is usually whether you're selecting a CAD-based format like DWG for CAD software or uh, a spatial database or shapefile for um, a GIS package. Uh, 
So QGIS being a GIS package, we'd always recommend you go for a spatial format. Um, but the options do vary between the different map products. So here we can see we've got two in GML and File Geo Database. For, 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 we would always recommend something like File Geo Database or Shapefile as your, as your go-to for, format for, um, for QGIS. So here we go, Shapefile if available, File Geo Database um, as well if available. You take Shapefile over File Geo Database, but I don't think there are any products that uh, have the two as uh, separate options. File Geo Database is an Esri format, but QGIS will read it without any problem, and uh, it's usually available on the big feature-rich, attribute-rich data sets like Master Map. Shapefile has an upper limit of two gigabytes, and if you're allowed to set, select a hundred kilometers square of a product, then uh, you could be approaching that limit. It's also got some limitations on on um, the number of, or the, the length of column names, which can cause a bit of problems with accessibility to the data. Uh, GML is also available, um, and there are converters for GML um, format, which you may find useful to take the GML, convert it, and then open it up in your GIS. Um, or you may just want to, to use the GML data straight, straight away in QGIS, which is also a possibility. Um, TIFF, if you have raster data, usually um, they're all available in TIFF format, and that's the best one for QGIS. Some of them are GeoTIFFs, which will just open directly in QGIS. Some of them are TIFFs with TIFF world files. Again, they open directly, but you need to have the world file with the data to make sure that it's georeferenced and put in the, on the map in the right place. And if you're looking at DTM or, or DSM data, uh, then the ASC format is the one that you want to choose for QGIS. Um, that's the ASCII grid, uh, and that's the one that, that, that um, produces the best results when you open it in QGIS. So looking at shapefile avail availability, things like vector map local, as I said, this is a product information panel that's opened from clicking the link on that side, uh, left-hand side. Uh, and so you can see here the vector map local is available in GML, DWG, and shape. So um, that we would pick the shapefile. And here's that show grid link I mentioned. Um, so other things like um, the um, contour data are available as shapefiles, uh, and pretty much every product in the vector data category in the Ordnance Survey. Um, all the geology vector data is available as shapefile too. If you're taking the Ordnance Survey master map topography, we definitely recommend that you take the file geodatabase format. Um, and then once you've got it into QGIS, you can save that as, as a series of shapefiles or as a geo package. It's one of the, the latest formats um, uh, that's being very well supported by QGIS uh, and is, is, a, is a spatial database format, very similar to file geo database. Um, uh, but it's, uh, yes, it's actually a bit more flexible uh, and a bit certainly more um, transferable between different uh, GIS software. Um, the alternative there is obviously to take the GML and then use something like um, the Interpose that's made a uh, Digimap version of Interpose which is available through the help pages or there's a, an Ordnance Survey Translator plugin developed by Lutra Consulting which you can put into QGIS and they will read that GML in and translate it into something a little bit more useful. Um, the conversions, uh, you can actually use the conversion process to merge several data orders from Digimap together or, or to actually get rid of some of the feature types you're not interested in if you want to sort of filter the data down a little bit. So that's why you would perhaps use the GML over a file to your database. But if you just want the whole thing for the area you've selected, take the file to your database and then just save it, save it as something, save it as a geo package would be the best way in, in QGIS. So yep, the Ordnance Survey Translator processes the GML, creates a shapefile, and it can process multiple chunks and multiple orders into a single, um, into a single uh, data piece, piece of data for you to use. Raster data formats, TIFFs, and, and the ASCs for the, for the DTM, grid of bathymetry, that sort of thing. Yeah, as I was explaining, some, some come as GeoTIFF, some come with a world file. And they're very simple. You just uh, drop them into QGIS and, and you'll be able to see them there. 
There is a, a format and conversion guide in the help pages. Uh, these slides will be available after the, the webinar, so you'll be able to sort of pick up the links from this. Um, and you, you can go there and uh, have a look at which the last column, uh, the QGIS column, will tell you um, the best formats uh, and the best ways to, to use the data in QGIS. So um, when you get the, the data from Data Download, it comes in a zip folder. Uh, and with each one, you get a folder for the mapping products that you've selected uh, and a contents.txt file and a citations text file. So if you're using this in your research, in a paper or a thesis, you can actually have a ready-made citation just to drop into your reference list at the end of your work. Um, it's best to extract the data from the zip file before using it, but it's not necessary. Um, QGIS will read your zip files as normal folders, so it will just go in there, open it, uh, and you'll be able to use the data straight away. You don't need to extract it from the zip file in QGIS like you do in other GIS packages. But it's usually a good idea to, um, if something minor corrupts the, 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 the zip folder, then you're going to lose all the data within it. Um, so it's probably better to extract it out and, and, and keep it there. So QGIS itself, um, you download QGIS for free from www.qgis.org. Um, it's free and open source software. There is no restrictions on how you can use it, what you can use it for. Um, it comes in Windows 32-bit, 64-bit, but also Mac and Linux versions. So basically, it's just really simple. There's no restrictions on where or when you can use it. You don't need to connect to any kind of license server or anything like that. So it's really flexible. You can stick it on your laptop and your desktop uh, and, and sort of interchange where you're working by sharing your data and map documents. Um, there are always sort of two versions of QGIS uh, available. The long-term release, which is generally supported for one to two years. Um, the help material will be um, up to date and there'll be bug fixes going on throughout those years of support. Um, so um, yes, they're usually the best ones to go for. Uh, it just depends how long the latest version has been around compared to the uh, the long-term release. So the LVs, the latest versions, have all the, the features uh, available, but they, they they tend to be maybe a little bit more buggy, um, uh, and they're not all the features are very well documented or, or stable in these in these latest versions. And the other thing is sometimes uh, if there's been a major change, then not all the plugins will be available. Uh, and there's a lot of power uh, uh, in the plugins and a lot of functionality there. So at the moment, we are in one of these periods where the long-term release is 2.18, uh, uh, sort of with point release 19 on top. So there's been 19 revisions of 2.18. So a lot of bug fixing, a lot of uh, uh, work has gone into making it a lot more stable. And the latest version is actually version 3.0. So a huge change to QGIS, loads of different functionality, loads of different uh, enhancements, slightly different looking interface, though not, not a lot of change there, but huge new uh, features like three, support for 3D uh, uh, and lots of other things going on there. But that means it is very, um, well, it's unstable at the moment. And so um, I wouldn't recommend using version uh, 3 until 3.2 comes out later this year, probably towards the end of the year. Um, but we're talking about the next long-term release probably being 3.4. So there's a lot of time and support left on version 2.18. Um, so that's going to be the most stable uh, and best option for, for quite some time. So once you've downloaded it and installed it, um, there's a few bits and pieces you can do for setting up uh, QGIS. There is a, a language option, which is uh, this called Locale uh, on, in the options box. But the main thing, um, if you're going to be using British data, then you can set the map up to always start using British National Grid as its default coordinate reference system, its default CRS. So you can do that to go into the settings uh, options and enable on the fly reprojection. So any data set you throw in there will reproject to the, uh, the default projection. And that you can also set there to be British National Grid. So that's a great way to set up for Digimap data. 
Um, when you save the map, similar to other GIS, like uh, ArcGIS, map documents are saved as a separate thing to the data. They're called QGS files. .QGS is the extension. And this saves the things like the zoom, the styling, uh, but not the data itself. So just like that. You also get a browser panel the first time you open up uh, QGIS. And you can do things like add your favorite folders, which makes it quicker to get to, uh, get to where your data. But you can drag and drop files into your layers panel um, and, and all these sorts of things. So you don't have to use the add data buttons that sort of stuff it's really nice free and easy uh, a lot of thought has gone into how to make this just easy to use so yeah that's all very good for that so if you do use the buttons for adding data um, rather than there being well actually in version 3 there is one button for adding data in 218 you'll see there's all these different ones the main ones you need to know about are the add raster data which has got the little checkerboard um, add vector data which has got um, this sort of uh, dots on a line, and the adding the CSV data, so things like points of interest data, um, post uh, co-point open data, all comes as CSVs. So you, you use the uh, these buttons to add those different data types. When you click on the add raster button, you can use your, just go into a folder where the raster data is, use control or shift to select multiple tiles, and drop them into the interface like that, no problem. Similarly, with things like shapefiles, click on that, browse to your location, grab your shapefiles. Again, you can use your uh, control or shift to select multiple files uh, and then just open them like that. File geodatabase is slightly a uh, bit different. So you go click your add vector layer, then you need to change from the file source type to directory and then choose open file geodatabase and then browse to your geodatabase file. I think it will ask you which layers you want to add from the geodatabase, and then you can open them from there. So this, you, yeah, you get your options, and that's the sort of result that you'll end up with. CSV data, um, unlike ArcGIS, you actually do all the selection of which are the uh, eastings and northings, your X and Y coordinates, at the point where you add the data so browse to your just click the um, the add CSV data browse to the location select the columns that have that spatial data and then it adds it straight away um, with with uh, ArcGIS you um, you add the data in and then you can convert it into XY data if you have non spatial data as a CSV that you just want to join as attributes to your information then you can see in here there is a there is an option that this this is no geometry data that's sort of uh, one of the options on the CSV so you don't have to select your X and Y columns but if you want to then make your data spatial you'll have to save any changes you've made and then re-import it to get to this stage which is the only place where you can select those X and Y fields so once you've done that there you can see the points displayed on the map so styling vector data in QGIS um, there's some really good options in here um, so obviously when you add it you'll get this sort of messy looking thing that we've got on the left and you're probably going to want something that looks more like you want the thing on the right so um, there are lots of styling options. There's uh, plenty of ways of doing it in QGIS. You can also import the, the styling. Ordnance Survey are pretty good now in providing um, QGIS compatible styling files as well as the ArcGIS ones. Um, you can use obviously your, uh, just make your color schemes up yourself as well. So uh, just going through the different layers uh, and um, adding these sorts of things uh, using the style tab so of course just like any other GIS you can uh, base your color schemes on various categories or attribute data that you've got with that come along with it so different classifications of roads can have different thicknesses and different colors just like you can with other GIS software in uh, the latest versions from 2.16 onwards, you can actually just press F7 and it opens up what's called the layer styling panel on the right hand side of the map. And this is great because the changes you make on 
in the panel happen instantly on the map. There's none of this having to click apply or OK every time you make a change to see how it looks. Uh, would recommend that you maybe zoom in a little bit so there are maybe less features on the map whenever you every each time you change something it will redraw so if it takes a long time to redraw you you might want to sort of zoom in but you can see right down at the bottom of the panel there is a live update checkbox so you can turn that off if you know you're going to make a load of changes and it'll take a while to redraw um, but there's some really good advanced features in the in QGIS's styling so we've got the 2.5d maps um, this is obviously not 3D like uh, the, the QGIS 3 has, but you can select this option and it just asks you a little bit of information on how you want to style the sides of your polygons and then it will also um, ask you for an attribute column such as the building height attribute column that can provide for master map data and it will extrude up the, uh, the various features by the value in that uh, attribute column. So here we can see the um, what was the Edinburgh Royal Infirmary is now a, um, a housing development. And if there are issues, you can see the order of drawing hasn't been completely right each time. Um, these problems sort of kind of go away if you're dealing with sort of low features that are spread, or spread apart. But here where we've got some tall buildings all next to each other, the, the, the drawing order hasn't been perfect there. So um, things to play around with, but uh, you can make some really good looking maps. There is a heat map option, just a, quickly select, change your styling to heat map and it allows you to um, create heat maps on the fly with your point data sets. Uh, here we've got postcodes in Edinburgh weighted by the number of domestic delivery points in each postcode uh, and you can, there's a range of different um, options that you can play around with here to, to improve the styling of that change the color scheme and all this kind of stuff. But again, a really quick way of making uh, a good data visualization uh, in QGIS. Hill shading, um, again, it's just a style option rather than having to go through a process. Uh, lots of things that like you can change the angle uh, and of, of where the sun is and how high it is in the sky. Um, use your uh, some good layer rendering, bright, brightness, blending modes, saturation and things like that to change the color. Um, also, uh, again, really quickly, you can just change down at the bottom there the resampling method to cubic, which stops that silly sort of blocky um, edges. If you just leave it as nearest neighbor, you end up with these sort of zigzag lines where the pixels of the DTM were in the original. So it smooths it out nicely uh, and gives you a really good looking hill shade model. Blend modes, I did mention that, and that this is... Um, uh, only really available in QGIS. I've not seen it in another GIS. Uh, these are normally found in your sort of graphics packages, uh, and it sort of mixes the layers between, mixes the colors between the layers without using transparency, which has a tendency to wash them out. So here I've mixed three layers. I've got a um, the one to fifty thousand scale color raster, which in QGIS you can just grayscale by ticking a box, um, and then I've added on top of that uh, a hill shade model from the um, one to uh, terrain five DTM um, again just using the hill shading there and then I've added the geology over the top but you can still see all the detail in everything really really clearly this is the multiply blend mode which is the same effect as putting the different layers on a on an overhead projector and then projecting that onto a screen if uh, if you can remember what an overhead projector is it's just slide transparent slides which you can put different um, writing or different colors on, and you put them all under a single light source. If you've got a very dark backdrop that you're wanting to put your, your uh, colors on, then you can use thing, something like the screen blend mode, and that's the similar effect to having like three projectors, each with a different map on it, and then shining them on the same spot on a wall. So it, it kind of washes out the dark colors with the, with the brighter colors on the top, whereas this preserves the dark map detail and then puts your other colors on top using the, the um, multiply blend mode. Draw effects, you can do some really cool stuff by adding blurs, inner glows, outer glows, drop shadows. This is earthquake data on the left hand side. Um, dots are scaled based on the magnitude of the earthquake and then we've added some sort of different colored blurs to, to make this sort of look like uh, sort of fireflies. Uh, and again, over on the right-hand side, this is Strava data. And we've just uh, thickened the line based on the number of times someone's 
uh, cycled or run down that that particular route and then added this glow on the outside to sort of uh, just give it some extra impact so the style files um, we do provide style files for some uh, vector data products they are usually either an SLD file or sometimes we've had to use SLD will work in any open source uh, GIS software uh, QML files are the other ones and they only work in QGIS but sometimes it depends on how complex the um, the actual styling is so the geology data um, we're, we're hoping to ship ship that with QML files um, because the styling is a bit too complex for a simple SLD so just have a look in the this the zip file that you get with your data there could be something in there or go to the um, the actual product page it's the more info link from the uh, the the box in the data download or you can just go to the help for that data collection uh, and there'll be a list of the products uh, and there'll be a link say out to the uh, Ordnance Survey website where they'll be providing either SLDs usually SLDs for the Ordnance Survey I think so uh, a quick look at some of the common geoprocessing tools in QGIS these are the sorts of things you're quite likely to use on uh, Digimap data First of all, we'll have a look at merging vector data. So if you go into the vector menu of QGIS, into the data management tools section, you can just merge lots of shapefiles into one. So useful for things like the terrain contours, OS terrain contours. You can, you can merge those, uh, and then they'll all appear as one thing. Similar thing you can do in uh, the raster data. Um, go into the raster menu, miscellaneous, and merge, and that will merge them together. You can quite quickly overload QGIS um, so uh, don't try and merge too many tiles in one go remember to pick them in square blocks so if you were to merge say um, 32 uh, or 16 tiles of um, of data you could do them in chunks of four and then they'll merge those four chunks of four together into into 16 um, you'll be able to do more than that in, a, in, in one go, but it, it, it's quite often the number of tiles you're merging rather than the size of those tiles, but I think size will probably come into it as well if they're very big. Clipping, um, quite often we provide you data in very large tiles, so if you want to clip them down to a smaller area, there's a vector version, vector geoprocessing tools and clip, uh, and raster you can do extraction, and then go into the clipper that will probably ask you for another raster tile to use as an outline or a vector um, polygon to use as an outline to clip the raster too very good if you're wanting to reduce down the size say if you've taken something that's on a big 100 by 100 kilometer tile and your area of interest is only a small one by one kilometer area that's the way that this is how you would reduce that data down and uh, getting towards the end now but we can have a look at some of the plugins so extended functionality through plugins and their access through the plugins mem uh, menu so here's a quick look at some of our favorites uh, quick map services allows you to bring in from the web a huge number of layers uh, some of these really cool uh, stamen design ones like the, the watercolor one you can see there there's an open layers plugin as well so the difference between the two you've got much more choice in quick map services um, but it can be a bit flaky some of them come and go uh, whereas the open layers one is much more stable but it has a much much smaller choice uh, and it's a little bit slow as well so sometimes when you refresh the map some of the tiles don't come back now in QGIS 3 they've tried to sort of um, do away with the need for these plugins by having a direct uh, WMS call uh, where you can just have the feed go straight into your map um, so open layers has not been ported over to QGIS 3 but quick map services has because it just provides such a huge catalog of different layers that it's still really really useful because if you don't really know what you want and want to try out a load of different ones then it's a really quick way of doing that um, MM QGIS is a really sort of sort of Swiss Army knife of a plugin really good really useful we like to use it for creating things like these hexa hexagonal grid lines but you can use square or rectangular grids there's all sorts of other things in there for geocoding animating uh, creating buffers on multiple points all these sorts of things and a really good uh, thing in there if you want to create Voronoi diagrams uh, sort of polygons around points where each side is the sort of midpoint between each point that sort of thing really good um, sort of multifunctional 
toolbox there that you get with that pun. QGIS to 3JS, so that lets you create a 3D scene. Um, so at the, in QGIS 3, obviously, you can do this natively, but this still has a use, and it has been ported over to 3, because you put your data in there, you set up your scene with your DTMs, or you can do this on sort of more statistical information, extruding out hexagonal grids based on, a, on an attribute value, that sort of thing. But you set it all up, and then you run the program, and it actually creates a very portable um, website. So you can share it really easily, either put it on your web server or just send a, a zip folder with all the HTML files in. And you can browse and click on the map and find out information, zoom, pan, spin around the scene, rotate it, all these sorts of things very easily in a web browser. And it works in all the, all the web browsers as well. So this is just the, those buildings we saw again uh, extruded up. And you can zoom and pan around this. There's a little control box in the side there, which makes it very useful. So a few others, QGIS to web, that's another one. You set up your map, uh, uh, click a few buttons, make a few settings, and it actually just publishes it as a website uh, with an interactive map using either leaflet or open layers. It's done all the hard work for you, so you can just open that up really easy. But do remember not to publish the licensed data using this method, or any method really. Uh, on a public website because that would be in breach of the license conditions. You're only allowed to use those static base maps in the backdrop when you're putting um, uh, maps on the web from Digimap, unless they're obviously the open data you can do that with. There's a cartogram plugin which is really cool for creating cartograms from your data, so scaling the size of uh, polygons based on an attribute value there. There's ones for terrain analysis and zonal statistics uh, for analyzing your raster data or even vector data sets. There's some good ones. There's Quick OSM, which allows you to download OpenStreetMap data uh, and use it directly in, in QGIS. Uh, very helpful if you may be using uh, QGIS for areas outside the UK, uh, outside of Great Britain, and you want uh, good data for there. And then there's Time Manager, which is one of my favorite plugins, which allows you to, um, to pick out a, a, a time, a temporal element in your data. If there are, you know, buildings existed from a start and end date, you can use that information within your, um, within your GIS, add that fourth dimension, and it allows you to uh, create animations over time. So which buildings have come and gone, or... Uh, which which point features have appeared at which times, that sort of thing. So, yeah, you can create some pretty exciting stuff with those plugins. So if you want to know uh, more, the stuff on the Resource Center, the Digimap Resource Center, uh, that's linked to from the, uh, the home page. Um, uh, you can get it to get to it from the help as well. And there's links to all the different help pages and guides and FAQs, videos, Webinars such as this one are all stored on these pages. There's case studies in there and, and plenty, plenty more things to look at. Uh, as I mentioned, the help pages, yep, that's how you get to the resource center up there, top right. Um, so if you look in there, there's a QGIS section for more information, more guides on using Digimap data in QGIS. Um, <clears throat> and also in the PDF exercises in the learning and teaching zone, there are some step-by-step -step guides in PDFs that come with the data, uh, and some of those have been written for QGIS as well. Um, just a quick mention that there's the chat box that's available um, during office hours. So hopefully the, there's usually someone manning that. So if you've got any more questions, that's a good place to go. Or you can just email us or phone us in the usual way. Okay, so that's the end of the slideshow. If anyone has any further questions, we'll be around for a few more minutes. Um, so if you've got any questions, then let us know. Otherwise, Thank you very much for listening. As I mentioned, um, a copy of the slides, a video of this webinar, and all the questions that have been asked uh, and their answers will all appear, uh, and we'll get those emailed, emailed links to you, but they'll also be in the help pages too. Thank you very much for listening.